So, I would just like to take a, a short time, not too long, to, to share the Word of God with you. And um, the last, I've, 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 for my, my friends, welcome to my, our friends from Kairos Ministries. I uh, appreciate you guys, brothers and sisters. And um, I've ministered the last three opportunities from this portion of Scripture. I promise I do know more than this one chapter of Scripture. Okay. But if you can turn with me to the book of Acts in chapter 8. And we're going to talk from there again for some of you, the second, third time or fourth time for some of you. <clears throat> so Acts chapter 8, and we're going to talk from uh, verse, verse 4. And uh, begin, Acts chapter 8 begins with Saul persecuting the church. And it says in, in verse 4, Therefore those who were scattered went everywhere preaching the word. Then verse 5, Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ to them. And the multitudes with one accord heeded the things spoken by Philip, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. For unclean spirits, crying with a loud voice, came out of many who were possessed and many who were paralyzed and lame and were healed. And there was great joy in the city. Everyone say there was great joy in the city. But there was a certain man called Simon who previously practiced sorcery in the city of, and astonished the people of Samaria, claiming that he was someone great, to whom they all gave heed from the least to the greatest, saying, This man is the great power of God. And they heeded him because he had astonished them with his sorceries for a long time. But when they believed as he preached the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, both men and women were baptized. Then Simon himself, sorry, can I just get a bit more volume on the mic here? Then Simon himself also believed, and, and he was baptized. And he continued with Philip and was amazed, seeing the miracles and signs which were done. Now when the apostles who were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent Peter and John to them, who when they had come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. For as yet he had fallen upon none of them. They had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then they laid hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. When Simon saw that through the laying on of the apostles' hands the Holy Spirit was given, he offered them money, saying, Give me this power also, that anyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. But Peter said to him, Your money perish with you, because you thought that the gift of God could be purchased with money. You have neither part nor portion in this matter, for your heart is not right in the sight of God. Repent therefore of this your wickedness. And pray God, pray God, if perhaps the thoughts of your heart may be forgiven you. For I see that you are poisoned by bitterness and bound by iniquity. So here we see a story where Philip, the evangelist, goes down to Samaria and revival breaks out. People are being healed. Demons are being cast out. The lame are walking. There's a great revival and there's great joy in the city. All right? A massive revival. And the apostles who are in Jerusalem hear about what's happening in Samaria, and they send uh, Peter and John down to Samaria to go see what's happening. And when they come down, they begin laying hands on people to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now I want you to see something. There was all these supernatural spiritual things taking place. There was great revival. People being healed, people being saved, demons being cast out. There was this amazing revival and all these wonderful things were happening around them. But there was nothing happening inside of them. What I'm trying to say with that is there was no dynamics that was taking place inside of them. Dr. Jonathan David has, uh, says, says, that which is taking place on the outside must then be deposited on the inside. So the revival that is taking place on the outside must happen in me for effective change to take place. It is no good just being part of a revival where supernatural things are taking place. The gift of healing does not change your life. It just fixes your body. I'll say it again. The gift of healing does not change your life spiritually. It just fixes your body. Jesus healed 10 lepers. Only one of them experienced life change. Because only one of them came back and said thank you. Jesus said, where are the other 10? Healing is there not to convict people of their sin and bring them to Jesus. Healing is there to heal the body. It's a physical demonstration and manifestation of God's power that makes them aware of God, that gives them the opportunity to repent to the Word. 
Are you with me? It's the Holy Spirit that brings conviction within the hearts of people. That brings about change. But that which is happening on the outside must take place on the inside. This is really important. This is the crux of the message today because there's three situations that hopefully I can get to talk about. I only talked about one in Afrikaans service. But there's three situations I want to talk about. The first one is you may be sitting in the congregation. Or I'm, I'm looking up here, okay? So if, if the Lord convicts you, then it's not my fault. Okay, it's the Lord. <laughs> but you may be sitting in the congregation and people are experiencing God. People are, are worshiping and the worship leader says, I just experienced God's presence here right now. And you're like, mm, where? I don't feel anything. I don't experience anything. I don't hear anything. I see people crying. I see people singing and on their knees. And I hear people praying tongues, but I don't experience any of this. My first, one, my first challenge is to you. It's not just about what's taking place on the outside, but you've got to let what is on the outside break out on the inside. Turn with me quickly to John, uh, not John Genesis 7-11. You're a one-stop shop, 24 hours a day. 7-11. Oh, 7-11 is, why do they call it 7-11 hours a day, seven days a week? Doesn't sound right. Genesis 7-11. Are you there? Now, the Old Testament <clears throat> has a wonderful way of pre uh, pre presenting us what I call prophetic pictures of biblical principles, of spiritual principles. All right? So, Genesis 7, verse 11. She doesn't know his soul. Okay. That's 11. In the 600th year of Noah's life, and yes, you are reading the right scripture. In the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, the 17th day of the month, on that day, all the fountains of the great deep were broken up. Everyone say, fountains of the great deep. All the fountains of the great deep were broken up, and the windows of heaven were opened. Everyone say, windows of heaven. So we have fountains of great deep and windows of heaven. Now, this is a prophetic picture of God's presence for me. All right. Now, God's presence. God is what we call omnipresent, which means he's everywhere all the time. So right now, we are gathered together in the name of Jesus. And the Bible says, when two or more gathered in my name, there I am in their midst. God is here right now with us. Whether you experience him or not, whether you see him or not, God is here. He's omnipresent. But you see, there's times like during worship, when I'm worshiping God, I experience God's presence. I, we, 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 we feel Him on the outside. Like the song says, Let it rain. Open up the floodgates of heaven. I'm not going to sing. Let it rain. Are you with me? We feel God's presence like rain. This is what, what, I call, or what we call God's manifested presence. Everyone say manifested presence. So there's God's omnipresence. Then there's God's manifested presence. This is when He reveals Himself to us. But truly, it's us turning our focus towards Him. That's why you experience a manifested presence in intense times of focus. Because God never leaves. God never goes anywhere. God is always with you. Are you with me? It's our focus that strays and goes everywhere else. But the, when, the more and more intensely we focus on God and His presence that is here, then He begins to reveal Himself to us and manifest Himself to us. That's why it says, Seek me with all your heart and you will find me. When you seek me with your, all your heart. Because when you start to seek, you turn your heart's attention. You turn your mind's focus towards his presence. And you begin to see and experience his presence. And that is God's manifest presence that we feel on the outside. But now the problem is, God is not only on the outside. He's on the inside. It's not inside, it's on the top. I don't know why that came to my mind. For you older generation, you know that one. <laughs> younger people are like, huh? what is he talking about? Okay. 
Uh, where was I? <laughs> it's on, it's on. <laughs> but it's not just about what's happening on the outside because you see the modern day church unfortunately gets so caught up with what's happening on the outside. And many times what's on the outside needs an external thing to, to motivate it. Like the prophet used a musician to stir himself up. It's not wrong. It's not wrong. It's fine. But you know what begins to happen is I need that atmosphere. I need a wonderful worship team. I need a good electric guitar. When the drum is too loud, I can't focus on God. I need the lights. I need the smoke machine. I need the overhead projector. Have you noticed how we become like digital sheep in worship? We know the song off by heart. But when the words don't appear, I feel lost. I don't know what to do anymore. Okay, it's only me. Okay. <laughs> but worship is not just an external experience. Worship comes from the inside, and that is where the fountains of the great deep need to be open, broken open. Because you see, God lives inside of you. Whether you experience it or not, whether you know it or not, God lives inside of you. Is that other mic somewhere? I think this one is going in and out. I think something is dying here. Testing. Oh, well, that's nice. Mm, radio console. <clears throat> and this is where we've got to start to focus on the indwelling presence. So we had God's omnipresence. Everyone say omnipresence. God's manifested presence. Now we're talking about God's indwelling presence. This is God's presence that lives inside of me. The life of God that is inside of me. I am the temple of the Holy Spirit. We are the house of God, where God wants to come and live. If anyone loves me, he will obey my commands. And we, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we will come and make our home with him. Home is where he dwells, where he lives. We are the new Jerusalem, the heavenly Jerusalem. We are the temple of God. And this is what, I, what the crux of my thing is to know this morning, is that we need to learn to allow the life of God to break out from the inside. You see, when you start to acknowledge and respect and honor the presence of God in the inside, by the way you live, your heart's attitude, your mindsets, more and more God begins to reveal Himself on the inside. And the more broken you live, the more broken this earthly vessel begin, uh, uh, becomes, the more the presence of God is there on the inside diffuses as a fragrance to the outside. Not just preaching about Jesus. The Bible says that Philip, didn't say Philip went and preached about Jesus. The Bible said Philip preached Christ. It's introducing them to the person of Christ. That people tangibly experience God through your life. There's no more privileged position. I don't know if you've experienced, but when you stand next to a non-believer and they feel so uncomfortable in your presence for some reason, because they are convicted by your sin. Yes, did I say something else? By their sin. I said it right in my head, okay? They are convicted by their sin, but the Holy Spirit inside of me is stand, I'm standing next to this guy, but the Holy Spirit just like grabs on. Are you with me? But that only happens when you are broken inside, when it's not about you. That diffusion, I, uh, I don't know what the Afrikaans word for diffusion is. Uh, past the bar, diffusion. He diffuses his fragrance. Like spite for spray. Spite is a forget of it. I could just think of deodorant and fragrance. But that presence must be diffused from our lives. I remember, I can share many examples, but the one example I shared in the morning service, I was in Uganda, and in Uganda, for supper, oh, get hungry all of a sudden. They have these brides on the side of the road. And they bright tilapia, which is a fish from the Nile River. It's fantastic. 
And so I would go there in the evenings. And one evening I went there and I'm waiting by the bra for my, my fish. And this young Muslim man comes up and stands next to me. And I just look at him and I say, hello. And he looks, I'm Muslim. I'm Muslim. Doing this. I'm Muslim. I'm like, I know you're Muslim. I can see you Muslim. You've got the hats on and everything. And I, and I stood there and I, like the weirdest experience. Like, why did he manifest like that? Why did he react like that? And then I realized when I said hello, somebody inside me also said hello. If you look at great men and women of God, Catherine Kuhlman was an example. She used to walk into an elevator full of people and the doors would close. Ding, ding, and then when the door opens, everyone's lying on the floor. She's the only one standing and she walks out. Because no one could stand near her. John G. Lake said it, used to, it became very lonely in the height of his ministry because people would come near him to greet him, but as soon as they came too close, they would just fall down under the power of God. People could not approach him. Not because he's someone great, but because the brokenness of the vessel allowed God to manifest and people could not come near that glory. What is that other man... Um, Great man of God, I can't remember his name. He would walk into a town or a village and people within a mile radius would fall under the conviction of the Holy Spirit and begin crying out to God and repenting without him, them even seeing him. Samuel carried an anointing so strong that his, his, the, the, the presence of God in his life covered the whole nation of Israel because when he, when he came into authority, the Bible says that the whole nation of Israel was protected from the Philistines. And when he died, the Philistines were again able to enter into the land of Israel. We've got to realize what we carry. We are God carriers. We carry, wherever we go, we carry the presence of God. You do not come into the presence of God when you come to church. You bring the presence of God into church. Are you with me? Sure, in a greater capacity what we, when we come together as living stones. But we've got to realize more and more that we carry the presence of God inside of us. And this is really important when it comes to the context of church. But you see the second part, the, the, another part is there are many born again Christians who are, who are saved, baptized, even possibly baptized in the Spirit, operating the gifts, but you're still dying of spiritual thirst. You feel empty. You don't feel God's presence. You're not experiencing those spiritual breakthroughs. That is because your well is blocked. Because you see, there's a fountain of living waters that is inside of you, but you need to let it flow. You need to let it flow. Like you need to let that river flow. And sometimes the fontaine is eh, stop. The well is blocked. And uh, sorry, I didn't have time to go check it. I think it was Abraham. Uh, Abraham and Lot. Abraham dug some wells. And what happened is Lot's shepherds came and blocked up the wells. Is it Abraham and Lot? Okay, people say yes. We trust that it is so. But they came and stopped up the wells, and then they had to break open the wells again, the next generation. But there are certain things. The enemy will want to come and block that well. You see, he cannot stop God. But if you allow him, he can stop the life of God flowing through you, through rejection, through fear, through judgment, whatever it may be. There are so many things that can, inside of us, like with Simon, he was saved, he was baptized. He was, he, was, he was walking with, with Philip in the revival. He was the testimony boy in the revival. But yet when it came to it, Peter through the Spirit, the, with the gift of discernment, looked at him and said, I see you are poisoned by bitterness and bound by iniquity. Someone who is baptized, someone who is saved, but yet inside he is still poisoned, he is still bound not in his spirit necessarily, but in his soul. There are things that are blocking the life of God from flowing. And I want to challenge you this morning. What is blocking your fountain? What is blocking the life of God from flowing through your life? Self-consciousness. 
meaning I'm, I'm, which is pride. I'm so focused on myself. What will they think of me if I lift my hands up in worship? Or what will people, th- I'm so concerned about myself. These are all type of hindrances that we need to remove from our lives that God can break forth, that the life of God can break forth. And this becomes vitally important in the context of church. Because we need amongst one another to share the life of God. Are you with me? Turn with me to 1 John 1 verse 1 to 3. One John one verse one to three. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, everyone say which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, everyone say which we have seen, which we have looked upon, and what our hands have handled concerning the word of life. That which we have seen, that which we have heard, that which we have looked upon, and our hands are physically handled regarding the word of life. Who is the word of life? Jesus. That which we have seen and heard, we declare to you that your fellowship may be with us, but truly our fellowship is with the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, right? Sorry, that's the Conrad International Vision. All right? What is that saying? Can I just have uh, three young men? Uh, one, three young men. Emilia is the oat. Just quickly, quickly, quickly. You, you're still young, blessing. That's okay. Yeah, Franzal, I believe. Okay, let's choose who's going to be the holy ones. <laughs> okay, you two stand this side, please. And then Franzal this side. So what is that saying? He is saying... What I have, now you can stand there, just stand there. What I have seen regarding my relationship with God, what I have heard, what I have looked upon in the Word, what my hands have physically, tangibly experienced in my relationship with God. This is what I share with you. This is what I declare to you. That you may have fellowship with me. But truly, my fellowship is with Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So, I'm bringing you not into fellowship with me, but I'm bringing you into this fellowship that I have with the Trinity. I'm tangibly sharing with you my relationship with God, and I'm drawing you and bringing you into the God that I know. And this is not only non-believers and evangelism. This is with brothers and sisters. Paul says, Paul says, but my God will supply all your needs. He was speaking to Christians, right? Why did he put it like that? But my God will supply all your needs. Isn't his God also their God? But it's this principle. You see, in my relationship with God, I'm experiencing his abundant, wonderful provision. I'm tangibly experiencing this in my life. So when I go and I share it with you, you're not only having fellowship with me and saying, wow, what an amazing testimony. But I'm bringing you into fellowship with that provision, the God of that provision that I have, so that you get to know God the way I know God. Because you, you might know God in the regards to open doors and ministry or whatever it may be. And I can be edified and learn God, about God like that. But I'm bringing you into a dimension of which I experience God. So that you can know God the way I know God. Now it's your God that supplies all your needs. This is sharing the life of God with one another. Thank you. This is what fellowship is. Are you with me? And it doesn't always have to be super spiritual and scripture and everything like that. But I believe we do need to come to, back to uh, the basics of a realization of why, why we come together. I've had the opposite journey. I've had to learn that church is also about social. So it's hard for me to say socializing because <laughs> I'm such a social bunny. I love I'm such a social person. Uh, uh, all the people nodding, saying amen. <laughs> it's good to fellowship. It's good to to have friendship. But you know, we have a whole week. 
And I think one thing we miss at church in, as Christians is because, because we think we gather together on a Sunday and say hello to one another, we don't have to visit or talk with each other during the week because I get to see them on Sunday. Non-believers don't think like that. They visit with one another during the, whole, during the week. Are you with me? They have fellowship. And for me, I believe that there are times when we can socialize. And I'm not saying you cannot socialize at church. But what I'm saying, when we come to church, what is the purpose we come together? Think carefully. We come together in the name of Jesus, right? To worship Him, to listen to His Word. And when we come together, the Bible says, when two or more gather together, there I am in the midst. And that is the purpose, the primary purpose. And sometimes I think we, we kind of get confused with the primary purpose. And the problem is when we set a culture like that, people who come, who are new to the church, are baptized into that culture. Are you with me? And I'm not saying you must be all deep. I, I, I struggled with this thing for a long time. I was in a church in Johannesburg helping to pastor there. And I would finish preaching and ministering. And I struggled to talk a small talk. You know, and, and unfortunately, for some reason, the ladies found me a bit intimidating. I'm a friendly guy. I don't, I don't know where they got that from. You know? <clears throat> but I struggled with it. And then all they could do is small talk. So they would talk about their dogs, their poodles, whatever, Woolworths, you know. And I struggled so much at the beginning. And I just want to know, what is God doing in your life? And I would come out with that question. Hello, how are you? What is God saying to you? They, they just, it's just like they cannot, they could not, let's, let's start at the shallow end first. And then we can go deeper. Yeah. <laughs> but my perspective was, I've just got this one hour after church to speak to these people. I want as much impact as possible. So I, I, for me, I didn't see the relevance of your dog or Woolworths or anything like that. So I had to learn because I also had to realize it's not super, I'm not, I mustn't be super spiritual and I must be able to socialize and relate with people about their dogs, about Woolworths, whatever it may be. But I think sometimes we take the culture to an extreme where it becomes a social club. Are you with me? And <laughs> we've, got, we've, got, we've got to come to the, back to the original purpose of what church is. Even cell group. Yes, cell group is more social. But there it's for us to, exp for us, because here I've got the mic and I speak. You don't speak, unfortunately. But in cell group, it's your time to share what you experienced about the word, how you experienced the time for you to exercise your gifts and to minister to one another and lay hands on one another. But you're still gathered together in the name of Jesus, sharing life. Are you with me? We've got to keep that purpose. Because you know what? Church becomes a governing power. Once we step into the apostolic flow, church becomes a governing power. It becomes like Dr. Jonathan David says, the UN, except much more effective. Where we make decisions over nations. We make the decisions over the destinies of towns and cities. Where what we proclaim, we declare God's word. That is what church is. But we can never come to that place of stature unless we ourselves develop the maturity and the life of God inside of us. The stature to be able to operate like that. More than that, John 13, 34, 24. A new commandment I give unto you. That you? Love one another as... As I have loved you, by this will all men know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another as I have loved you. This is what will mark you out as a quality church, is the quality of your relating. As I have loved you, how has Christ loved you? And look to the person not next to you, because that's one of your friends or your partner. Look to somebody in the opposite aisles. You're supposed to love them as Christ loved you. 
because we sit next to the people we like the most. So that's why you've got to look a little bit distance-wise. The people you sit furthest from. That quality of relating, and please, I'm not speaking from a place of perfection. This is something I'm working through. This is one of the weak points in my life is relating. I realize that I, I've got to put more effort into relating with the body. Because it's this type of quality. And Please don't put up your hands. Many of you have testified to me yourself. When you came to this church, why did you stay? A lot of people testify it's because they felt the love. They felt the fellowship. They felt like part of a family. And it's not just a socializing family, but the life of God that people must experience. That when people come in for the first time, they are baptized into the life of God. They are baptized into the fellowship of the Holy Spirit and the love of the Father. Are you with me? Because you set the culture, you set the tone for the oncoming generation. And by that quality, the world will know that you are my disciples. The quality of your marriages, the quality of your friendships with people in churches, the quality of your children. Let's not say that. The quality of the relationship that you have with your children. They have their own souls and their own choices. Okay? Are, are, are you with me? And when we begin to relate in such a way, then God is seen. And this is what I'm trying to say, is that the life of God must be seen in and through us. But for that to happen, we have to acknowledge and respect and honor the indwelling presence of God in us. So that was the second situation. The third one is, I'm so full of the gifts. I see everything that is going on. I can operate in the gift of discerning of spirits. I can prophesy. I can pray in tongues. I know all the spiritual lingo. I know how to say apostolic. I know how to say prophetic. I know how to... Wada, wada. But yet, I'm still hollow and empty inside. Paul says, if I have all the gifts, but I do not have love, I'm an empty... I'm, got, I'm a hollow sound... Without that intimacy, without that love, without the life of God inside, the spiritual stuff means nothing, or let's say very little. Are you with me? I've got to get to a place where I'm able to honor the Christ inside of me. Come to that place, because you know tongues will fall away, prophecy will fall away, all of these things will disappear. One thing will remain, love, God, your relationship with God. And you can fool people by being accurate prophetically. You can fool, pe fool people by being spiritual, prophesying and praying in tongues and knowing how to say things the right way, quoting scriptures. But you can't fool God and you're fooling yourself. Are you with me? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for who you are. And thank you for the privilege of being called your sons. Thank you that we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. And Holy Spirit, we acknowledge and honor your presence amongst us. We acknowledge and honor your presence inside of us. And even though some of us may not be able to feel that presence or experience that presence, we know by the truth of your word that you are here. We know by the truth of your word that you live inside of us. And this morning we open up our hearts, we open up our lives, and we say, come Holy Spirit, reveal yourself to us. In a way, the way that only you can do. It's not the work of man. It's only by your hand, Lord. And I pray that you'll teach us to respect your indwelling presence. And that you'll teach us to see in the Spirit that we may be able to see and experience the manifested presence of you, Lord. And to be aware of your omnipresence, that you are always there in every circumstance, in every opportunity. That there we will be able to see you because we can see clearly in the Spirit. 
But God, I pray that you'll help us to remove every obstacle that is blocking that fountain of the great deep from breaking, breaking open. Teach us how to remove these obstacles that we can finally drink from those rivers of living water and be fulfilled and be satisfied. That we will never thirst again, that we'll never go hungry again. Teach us to live in such a way. Father, I also pray that you'll teach us how to relate with one another accurately. That we'll be able to share the life of God with one another in our relationships, in the church, in our marriage, even with our enemies. How to love our enemies, how to reveal God, to be that fragrance of Christ that may be the odor of fatal doom, but yet still sharing the life of Christ with those out there. Establish this truth in our lives, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.